Hey, I will begin our webinar. Welcome everyone to Ontario Farmland Trust's October webinar. We're so happy to have you all here today with us um, to explore farmland protection options. My name is Teresa. I'm the Communications and Community Outreach Coordinator at OFT. I started out as a summer student and now have transitioned to this role. I have a background in environmental science, regenerative agriculture, and communications. And I'm really excited to continue to expand OFT's reach through webinars like this one. Also here with me from OFT are our presenters, Joel Enman and Megan Mills, which I will allow to introduce themselves in just a few minutes. Before we begin our session, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. OFT works across Ontario, but we are centered in Guelph on treaty lands and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the credit of the Anishinaabeg peoples, the original and ongoing protectors of these lands. Guelph resides on Treaty 3 between the Lakes Purchase Territory, representing an agreement and respectful partnership between peoples of different nations. As settler nations work to reconcile our relationships with Indigenous nations, we want our work at the Farmland Trust to reflect the respect deserved to the legacy of the original caretakers whose stewardship of the land has allowed us to enjoy the land's beauty and bounty today especially given that the role of land dispossession has been used as a tool of colonization, this context is really important for us to acknowledge. Some webinar housekeeping that I'll go through. So throughout the webinar, please um, participate and share comments in the chat. If you have any questions for Joel or Megan, please submit those using the Q&A feature. If you have a similar question to any that has already been submitted, please upvote that question by clicking the thumbs up icon, and this will move the question up in the queue, allowing us to answer the most popular questions first. I'll be on hand to provide support during the webinar, so if you have any technical issues, you can message me directly using the chat feature. If Joel or Megan use any acronyms or terms that are unfamiliar for you, please feel free to ask for clarity in the chat and we'll either respond in the Q&A session or share definitions or additional resources in the chat. Also, if you had joined OFT's Farmland Protection Options webinar last year, we're really excited to have you here again. This session will be a really great opportunity for you to refresh your knowledge and dive deeper into the topic. And if you are unfamiliar with the Ontario Farmland Trust, allow me to introduce us. We are the only province-wide conservation organization with a mission dedicated to the protection and preservation of Ontario's agricultural landscapes. It is so critical that we protect these lands because Ontario's prime agricultural land is a finite, non-renewable resource that comprises less than 5% of Ontario's land base. Farmland is the foundation of the agri-food sector that provides us with locally produced foods, employs more than 800,000 Ontarians, and contributes over $49 billion annually to the province's GDP. And yet, Ontario has lost 20% of our farmland in the last 40 years. The rate of farmland loss nearly doubled between 2016 and 2021 to a rate of 319 acres per day. And once farmland is developed, it's gone forever. So it is more important now than ever before that we protect our agricultural landscapes. And what exactly does OFD, OFT do to accomplish our mission? So we have a few main program areas. Um, the first of them and our main activity is permanently protecting farmland. We do that by working with farmland owners who want to protect their lands from future development we help them do this by placing a farmland easement agreement on the title of their property, or if they wish, they can donate their farm property to OFT. We also engage in provincial policy discussions on changing land use policy that impacts farmland, as well as our education and community engagement programming includes several outreach initiatives that aim to educate the public on what threatens these lands and how we can collectively work together to protect them, like webinars like this. So to date on this map that you see here, we have protected 26 properties amounting to over 2,700 acres of farmland, forests, and wetlands across Ontario. On this map, you'll see the areas in which we've permanently protected farmland, as well as areas in which we have ongoing projects in. And I'd also like to mention that it is not without the support of our dedicated donors and supporters that we're able to make such an impact on farmland preservation. And with that, we will begin the webinar today. Um, 
I really hope that this session will give everyone present an, op an introduction to the work of land trusts and options for landowners to protect their farmland and e its ecological features with a land trust such as OFT. I'll now pass it over to Joel and Megan to allow them to introduce themselves and share their valuable expertise on farmland protection options. Thank you so much, Teresa, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Joel, and I'm the Farmland Conservation Specialist with OFT. I joined the team last fall, and my background is primarily in animal care, land conservation, and environmental monitoring. And my educational background is in zoology, environment, and sustainability. At OFT, I'm mainly responsible for monitoring our protected properties and also uh, working on project work uh, protecting new properties. I joined OFT last fall and I'm passionate about protecting Ontario's precious farmland. I'll pass it over to Megan to give some background on how she came to join OFT. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Teresa, and uh, welcome everyone. Um, I've been volunteering with OFT for over seven years and I'm currently the chair of the Land Securement and Stewardship Committee. I have a rather mixed background that touches on property law, ecology, and ag policy. So the intersection of those fields and the work that OFT does made this organization a really great fit for my personal interests. Um, I, I love being out in the field, joining staff on the monitoring visits and seeing our protected properties firsthand and the impacts that the protections are making. Um, and I have for many years had a keen interest in conservation easements as a legacy type tool that gives landowners agency in their long-term future protection of their lands. Um, yeah, so I'm glad to be here today. Uh, and I'm going to turn things back to Joel uh, for the next part of the presentation. Great, so we'll start, uh, we're talking about farmland easement agreements. What are they? Farmland easement agreements are tools which give agency to private landowners who want to ensure their farm remains as farmland. Farmland conservation easement agreements provide some of the strongest levels of protection to conserve a property for agricultural purposes. This is made possible through Ontario's Conservation Land Act. When a CEA is registered, what's happening is that the rights to conserve land for agriculture are being donated for, to the Ontario Farmland Trust, and we hold on to those rights in perpetuity. Landowners will enter these agreements voluntarily and they cannot be forced on a landowner. We work with each landowner to make sure they are comfortable with the content of the agreement and what restrictions are included to provide necessary protection and to ensure that the conservation of the objectives of the landowner are being met. These agreements are placed on title of the property through the land registry office, which is how they remain in perpetuity even after the original easement donor moves on and the and OFT maintains the conservation rights and subsequent owners must abide by the agreement how it was originally written. Conservation easements are re recognized in legislation and are upheld by the courts, giving them the strength needed to assure the landowner that their property will in fact be protected. These agreements do not change the land ownership unless the land is being donated to the Ontario Farmland Trust, which is a separate way we can protect land. Otherwise, these agreements are simply donating the conservation rights of the property. Because this is seen as a donation and conservation rights do have public value, the landowner will receive a charitable tax receipt for the appraised value of the easement. It is important to note that these easements do not give OFT the authority to dictate how the farm operates and the landowner remains in control over the farming practices. So if you wanna get the process started, how, how do you go about doing that? If landowners are looking to start the process of protecting their land with the Ontario Farmland Trust, they should reach out to OFT directly. This can be done using our landowner inquiry form available on our website, sending an email to one of the staff or giving us a call. And all of our contact information will be shared at the end of today's presentation. Staff will then follow up to gather information about the property and the vision of the conservation objectives of the landowner. At this time, we can also answer any questions and further delve into OFT's processes. A property profile report is created based on the information we collect from the landowner so we can assess the alignment of the property and conservation objectives with OFT's program strategy and goals. The potential project must then be approved by the board. So what's involved in a project? Well, once the project receives board approval to go forward, then we can start the process of fundraising. 
Fundraising is an important part of the project as the Ontario Farmland Trust is responsible for all of the costs associated with the conservation easement agreement, apart from the landowner's own legal and tax advice. We take the financially responsible approach by securing the funding before each stage of the project. Some landowners may wish to contribute to the costs, however, this is not required to allow the project to go forward. However, any funding that the landowner provides is also considered a donation and will receive a tax receipt additional to the tax receipt that's administered for the conservation easement agreement. Landowner conservation objectives can be realized through different strategies. The entirety of the property can be protected as agricultural, or the property can be divided into zones, which have different levels of restrictions depending on the landowner's wishes for the property. Creating different zones requires a, a survey to be done on the property, and we typically use three zones on the property. An example of this can be seen on the screen right now. So the first zone is the forested and natural area that has the highest restrictions to land use, which is outlined in green. The second is the agricultural area, ensuring that land remains in agriculture, which is outlined um, in the white. And then the final would be the farmstead area, which is outlined in red on the screen and includes the farmer's residence, farm building clusters, and other non-agricultural structures on the property, like a woodworking shop, an art studio, or a pool, etc. However, farm building clusters can also be permitted in an agricultural area if landowners wish to include this in the, in the conservation easement agreement. Some landowners also might choose to do a single agricultural zone, so that can be seen on the screen right now. This can be done in cases where there's no forested area, or the landowners would like to have more agricultural related allowances in areas with natural features, such as grazing for livestock. The next step is drafting the terms of the agreement. The general purpose of the agreement is to protect the farmland in perpetuity. And OFT has general guidelines that we use in almost all of our conservation agreements, but the details are unique from property to property. And Megan will explain more on this later in the presentation. Once the agreement is drafted and the zones are finalized, an appraiser will determine the value of the conservation rights being donated. Typically, the appraiser will determine the fair market value of the property without the easement, and then they will determine the fair market value of the property with their restrictions. This process is done by looking at the sale price of other properties that have similar protections on them. The difference between the two appraised values is what is considered the value of the conservation easement and a charitable tax receipt for that value is issued to the farmer. Those tax credits can be carried forward up to five years. Again, at this point, we encourage landowners to talk to financial advisors and tax consultants who can give them the best advice on their specific financial situation. The appraiser has to look for the land's value based on its current designated use. So you will not see an appraisal done on speculative sale prices, and we typically see an easement valued anywhere between 10 to 17% of a property's fair market value. The Land Registry Office requires the conservation easement agreement, the survey, and a baseline documentation report. This report reflects the state of the property at the time the protection begins. This also becomes a critical tool for the land trust, so we have a record of anything that might appear as a violation at the time of monitoring, but predated the agreement. For instance, if there was an area where dumping has historically occurred, we would want to take note of that and know exactly where it is so that we wouldn't mark that as a violation in the future. And we can be aware of the state so we can ensure no future dumping occurs. Once the easement is registered, our work doesn't end there. We are then responsible for annual monitoring of the property, which includes site visits by qualified OFT staff to walk the property and ensure no violations occurred or note any changes in the condition of the property, such as if a disease is killing off trees or we notice any new invasive species on the property. This creates a great record of the land use and is value added for any future landowner if they are learning, interested in learning about the property's history. To ensure that OFT is a around for as long as our easements, we maintain an investment fund that pays for these monitoring activities. This ensures OFT is around in perpetuity and to continue monitoring and protecting these properties. And then finally, I'll talk about the Ecological Gifts Program. 
It, at this point, it's important to mention the federal government's Ecological Gifts Program, which provides enhanced tax incentives for landowners wishing to conserve their property. Tax credits can be used for up to 10 years instead of the usual five years for easement agreements, and they are exempt from taxes on capital gains. Lands must meet the qualifications for this program, meaning they are considered to be ecologically sensitive. There is a series of criteria which must be met in order to be eligible for ecological gifts program, and the property must meet both some of the national criteria and the regional specific criteria set out for Ontario. Some examples of this criteria are species at risk present on the property, proximity to provincial or federally protected areas, significant wetlands on the property, and there's also many others. To be eligible for this program, not all criteria have to be met, but the more that are met, the more likely the, the project will qualify. And if landowners are interested in pursuing this program, an ecological assessment would be completed on the property by OFT staff, and an application would be submitted by OFT on behalf of the landowner. So now I will pass it over to Megan to discuss more of the details of drafting conservation easement agreements. Thanks, Joel. Um, so you can see part of a, the opening part of a agreement here on your screen. Um, and while we do start with a template for drafting the easement agreement, it's really an ongoing and iterative process that involves a negotiation between the landowner and the land trust to settle on the specific terms that's going to meet um, objectives on both sides. Uh, in developing the template, though, we have drawn on our experience of over 20 years in farmland conservation agreements and base um, content on the Can Canadian land trust standards and practices. Um, also, our experience in working with landowners, receiving legal advice, and in incorporating that feedback each time. And based on that, we know that these agreements are going to work for farmers to support the viability of ongoing agricultural operations on the lands, and that they are also compliant with the Conservation Land Act and, Act and other legal requirements. Um, fair warning, these agreements do uh, contain a lot of legal language, and this is there to ensure that the agreement will withstand the test of time and can be defended if challenged by a future landowner. Uh, within the agreement uh, covenants and restrictions are defined on the property to protect the land for 999 years. Uh, we often say in perpetuity, um, but this 99, 999 years is as good as close as we're going to get and we think it's still pretty good. While the exact restrictions can be customized to the landowner's vision, some standard co covenants are um, included. Um, in the agricultural area, agricultural uses are permitted at the highest level. Uh, again, we don't tell farmers what to farm or how to farm, simply that the land can only be used for agriculture. Uh, in the non-agricultural area, sorry, otherwise non-agricultural activities can be restricted in order to preserve the water quality and quantity, prevent severances and subdivisions, restrict the types of buildings and development that are on uh, that are non agricultural uh, agricultural or by directing them to locations on the property that are protected. Um, in order to protect the greatest amount of farmland, such as the farm stand area that Joel mentioned earlier, you know areas along driveways and road frontage and that sort of thing, and this goes into the. Um, de defining those areas uh, at the survey stage. Uh, well, the agreements also will prevent uh, removal of topsoil or aggregate extractions, protect lakes and ponds, wetlands uh, that are part of the property, and restrict any sort of dumping from taking place. Between the initiation of the project and the complete, completed registration of the agreement, this can easily take up to two years. Um, to get all of the pieces together. Much of this time is taken up by grant applications for funding the project and also approvals, scheduling surveyors, booking appraisals, um, and this can sometimes take months depending on the availability of these professionals in the region that the project. Um, of course, certain activities like the ecological assessments are best done in the summer months when wildlife are active uh, and plant species can be better observed. 
And it's also not ideal to do a survey of a property when the corn is over six feet high. So these there is some seasonal timing to um, many of these activities. But during the downtime between the key steps that are taking place, we will be going back and forth, confirming the zones of the property um, and the details of the agreement with the prospective land donor. Um, and we are taking okay taking our time with this because we want to get it right and ensure that the landowner is satisfied with the levels of protection uh, that will be provided. Megan, I'm going to interject just quickly. Um, we're still having, uh, you're, you're a little soft coming through. So um, I know we chatted earlier, if you can uh, okay, try to- I'll try to lead a little in bit more. and hopefully we're, <laughs> we're a little better. Don't let the creepy face very well. <laughs> Thanks, Megan. Uh, sorry, everybody about that. Um, my mic, I guess, is not as sensitive as it should be. Um, so when it comes to protecting against threats, uh, the landowner uh, is thinking about what, oops, sorry, uh, thinking about what their conservation interests are. It's important to think about what you are wanting to protect against. Uh, and this can include a variety of um, threats to agricultural lands. Our easements will protect against uh, by preventing non-agricultural development while protecting the agricultural land uses. They prevent natural resource extraction from occurring on agricultural lands that would otherwise diminish the quality of the soil, such as aggregate extraction. And they can also protect against changing land use policies. Um, the permitted uses and restrictions from the easement agreement remain even if a zoning bylaw were to change and allow for other activities. Uh, and while the easement is about protecting a particular property, we do can we can associate some effects uh, that are broader. Uh, the easements can potentially contribute to keeping farmland more reasonably priced for the next generation of farmers by preventing speculative buying it by potential developers. And the preserved farmland and natural areas support water absorption and filtration and provide habitat for species at risk, which broadly benefits the surrounding community. So looking at um, a few of our protected properties, uh, I'll speak first about the Hudson property in Prince Edward County that was protected in 2020. Um, this property consists of two um, lots that are totaling just over 200 acres where they grow organic hay, heritage grains like rye, red fife wheat, buckwheat, and the property also includes two areas of natural scientific interest, the McMahon Bluff Escarpment Forest and the Black Creek Valley Marshes and Forests. And it's home to many species at risk including wood thrushes, eastern wood peewee, and butternut as well as meadow, eastern meadowlark and bogolink. So the Hudson properties were the first two properties that were protected by OFT in the Prince Edward County area. Um, four years later, we've protected another, an additional four properties in the county, and we're currently in the process of working on three additional projects that will protect six properties uh, by the end of the year or early 2025. And this is really exciting is because we can trace all these projects back to the work that we did with the Hudsons. Um, these landowners became huge advocates of ours, uh, and when news spread about the protection of their property, a growing number of landowners in the region signed up. They were very grateful for that relationship. Uh, another set of farms, the Farrow family farms in Bruce County, were protected in 2021. Uh, these represent a total of close to 630 acres of protected land. Uh, in this case, non-agricultural development had been encroaching on the area, um, as is the case in many regions of the province. Um, in this particular scenario, the development was less than a kilometer away. These two protected farms are home to a diversity of agricultural production and types of habitat for various species at risk, including, again, butternut, um, monarch, barn swallows, eastern meadowlark, and eastern wood peewee. The uh, significant acreage goes to show that we are able to protect a variety of farm sizes and customize our easement agreements to support all types of agriculture. If 
a conservation easement agreement is something that you're interested in. Um, there are a few things that as a landowner you want to consider. Uh, first off, you make us aware of your interest. Joel had earlier mentioned um, for a contact information being available, and this is going to be put up at the uh, at, towards the end of the presentation. Um, also, think about what you want to protect it and what's driving you to do it. Uh, what agricultural or natural features are important for you to protect on your property? Think about any plans you might have for new buildings or changes to the property that you think might occur in the future, or even if you don't have specific plans, just whether you want those that kind of option to be available to you. Uh, take a look at the EcoGIPS program, which Jewel mentioned, that great tax benefits, but again, it's not for everyone, and nor will every property qualify. The program property will need to fit their program criteria. Uh, and make sure that you have access to legal and accounting and taxation advice. Um, you want to understand the full implications of the agreement, and it's something that will permanently impact title to your largest asset. So it's critical that you are fully aware of all of the implications. Everyone's situation is different, and OFT cannot be providing you with that type of advice. Few common title issues to keep in mind. Uh, you want to make sure your property taxes are all paid up to date. And also, if there is a mortgage on the property, um, let us know and discuss plans uh, to protect the property with the lender. Um, a postponement can be registered if there is a mortgage, but uh, and it's not a difficult thing to do, but it does require uh, the lender's agreement. Finally, looking at other protections, um, if it turns out that OFT is not the right fit for you, either because your property is primarily forest and natural or our goals or protection timing capacity might not align with your needs, um, please do consider protection through other land trusts. There are a range of land trusts operating on a regional basis throughout Ontario, and the Ontario Land Trust Alliance as an umbrella group can connect you with a local land trust in your area. Um, also consider a broader based group like the Nature Conservancy of Canada. Our end goal is really to see the land protected. And if it's a, one of our partner organizations that does that for you, then um, we're quite happy that that's the case. Um, and so that concludes the formal content of the presentation. Here is the contact information that was mentioned earlier on, uh, including a direct email for Joel. Uh, we will leave that up there now and move over to questions from the audience, I think. And I'm, so I'll turn it over to Teresa, who is assisting with questions from participants. Yes. Thank you, Joel and Megan, for sharing your expertise with us. We have a few questions. Um, Tony Morris is asking, does the agreement mention the need to build or maintain biodiversity of wildlife species and the interdependence between agriculture and wildlife? So that is not laid out specifically in the agreement itself. It's kind of a draw, it's an understood and driving background, um, you know, it, it's in, our, the agreement is informed by that uh, desire and that we certainly see um, the importance of farmland as associating with the natural protected areas um, and facilitating uh, movement of species at risk and so forth. Um, in terms of outlining like how that management would occur, um, we don't get super specific in the agreement itself, but can develop management plans with a landowner if they are keen on initiating projects related to uh, in enhancing biodiversity and such. Joel, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? Yeah, just that there are, there's elements in the conservation easement agreement that like, just to echo what you were saying that help to uh, protect the species at risk. For example, in the forested and natural area, there would always be a limit to how much um, wood that can be taken out of the forest, protecting 
and then we which would help protect any forest dwelling species at risk and then there's other um discussions about protecting the water quality of the the land so more talking about the natural elements and by protecting the natural elements you're helping to protect the species on the property as well thank you um we have linda reader and uh they say i farm 90 acres but am surrounded by non-farm recreational properties what happens if they all sell to developers and my farm becomes too difficult to farm anymore if it is considered a conservation property can it remain that way and be sold Right, so a uh, big challenge. Uh, isolated pockets of farmland are a big challenge. Moving equipment, uh, um, setbacks, that sort of thing. Um, but the individual property can remain uh, protected, uh, which is any agricultural activity that would um, be occurring will still have to follow the rules that other um, agriculture would, um, but that property can remain protected. Yeah, so that, and just to say that, that if the land was then in the future purchased by a developer, they still wouldn't be able to subdivide that, that property further um, because it would be protected from severances and protected for the next 999 years from the date of the protection. Thank you too. Um, we have an anonymous attendee and they are asking, does the process represent a big cost for a landowner? So I can just say that the only costs that are on the landowner, that it would be their own legal and tax advice. So. Otherwise, the cost of the survey, uh, our staff time, all of the other project milestones are we fundraise to to pay for that as well. So there isn't not a, a huge cost on the landowner to get these projects in into place. And there is the financial incentive of the tax receipt at the end of the process as well for the landowner. And Jane Campbell is asking, can a landowner register a no development easement on title by themselves? So there needs to be two parties um, and involved in a conservation easement um, under the uh, Conservation Lands Act. Uh, and it would either be a land trust such as ourself, um, the Act sets out other conservation um, bodies that can be that other side of the agreement. Um, municipalities, indigenous groups uh, come to mind, and I believe there are a few other, but I have to check the act. But it, another party is required. Okay, and it looks like Tony. Morris, who had that initial question, is adding some more context. So maybe this um, will help them clarify what they're asking. But they are saying the question is not about species at risk, but how agriculture and wildlife at all levels are interdependent. Unfortunately, we have a system that places land into classes based on soil types, rather than understanding that class seven is just as important to the production of crops as class one. An example over pat the past 20 years has been the loss of common songbirds and insect diversity. I'm not sure if any, if either of you have any more to add to that. Agree with what's uh, being said, absolutely. Um, and. I'm not sure I understand the, if there's a question that needs more clarification. Uh, yeah. It's just additional context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just sounds like 
they're affirming that all classes deserve protection and that all classes have a, a level of biodiversity. Absolutely. We do have more time for- And, and, uh, and add a little bit more to that, if that's all right. Um, and Tony, really excellent point. This is something that um, with a lot of the work that we do within policy discussion and dialogue um, at the provincial level and try to raise awareness at municipalities um, through the policies that end up classifying um, agriculture versus rural lands, that um, they play a significant part in the entire system, um, both from the agricultural system as well as the ecological services. Um, so, you know, class seven does play a very important role um, in maintaining uh, health the uh, ecosystems, which is important to help uh, produce healthy uh, food for our communities as well. And so uh, we do take uh, a policy approach on, on advocating for the protection of that land just as, as much as uh, class uh, one, two, and three, which is considered our prime agricultural land. Uh, when we're looking at uh, particular properties, um, whether it is class one through seven, uh, if there is agriculture activity on it, typically what we see on the lower class lands is that you're seeing more grazing animals. Um, we still can protect that land for agricultural purposes, um, as well as uh, if if there's, let's say, a, a more marginal uh, uh, piece of land that is just not uh, conducive for agricultural productivity, it might be classified as class seven, um, but the uh, landowner would like to see it protected for ecological um, purposes, then we would put that land into the natural and forested um, protected area that uh, Joel had identified um, previously when we're creating the different uh, zones of the property. So um, the, the balancing act that we play is trying to uh, both ensure that our conservation easement agreements are going to help maintain uh, a future viable agribusiness on the property um, for, you know, those thousand years that the um, easement is in place. And then beyond that, um, we also want to make sure that the ecological integrity is also uh, upheld and maintained, uh, and we are able to do that through the forested and natural zones as well. So uh, it's it's a lot of moving pieces, and, and every property is different, and every landowner that we work with has has a uh, different level of interest in, in what conservation interest they're trying to protect on the property. Uh, we bring our level of expertise to how to structure the easement agreement to, to meet that, and at the end of the day, because these are voluntary agreements that landowners get into, um, we're trying to make sure that we are um, aligning both that long-term protection that we need to uh, ensure that we can monitor and protect for, while also uh, meeting the intent of that landowner. So it's uh, it's a, a constant balancing act and something that uh, we work very closely with the landowners. Um, and of course, having folks uh, like um, Joel, who brings his conservation expertise and Megan, the wealth of knowledge of having worked on these easements um, for a number of years, uh, we bring that forward to try to make sure that those easements are, are balancing all of that. Thank you, Martin. Um, Heather says, you stated that OFT does not control the farming techniques. Just to be clear, does that mean that an agricultural easement could not be designed to state the type of farming, i.e. if someone wanted to maintain an organic practice? That's correct. Yeah, we want to maintain that flexibility uh, for agriculture to occur 100 years, 300 years, 1,000 years from now, uh, rather than locking um, future landowners into a particular form of agriculture. Um, the point is that it, the, the land be, be um, kept available. And Michael P is asking, do costs of creating an easement vary with the size of the property? One of the key variables in the cost would be the survey. So it's not necessarily the size of the property, but the complexity of that uh, land. If there's, um, uh, if you've got a road running through and you end up actually having two separate parcels, if you have waterfront, if you have um, a complex border between um, the zones, like the agricultural zone and the um, uh, forested natural area, 
or in the farmstead area, the complexity will add to the cost, but not necessarily in terms of size. Um, Joel and Martin, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I would I agree with that. The staff time and that's spent doing the ecological assessment and the baseline documentation report, all of that is pretty standard across, de depending, it, the size doesn't really impact that, that cost that much. Thank you both. Um, we do have more time for some questions, so I will leave it open for you all to continue um, typing in your questions if you have any more. I do just want to add, um, I, I added a, a typed uh, addition to um, Heather's uh, question around um, maintaining as organically farmed and, and just in case other folks uh, don't see the response. Um, further to the context that Megan had provided, um, it's really important to note that the Conservation Land Act uh, is what gives us the authority to protect land and, and it outlines um, what we're able to protect and and the language in that act says that through an easement we can protect for agricultural uses but it doesn't give uh the land trust the ability or the authority really to protect for specific types of agricultural practices such as it being um, organic so uh, if we're protecting for agriculture uh, our authority uh, pretty much ends at being able to protect for um, just the agricultural uses and, and can't get more specific in that. There are um, more specific, um, uh, I, I should say, a, a stronger authority to protect um, when it comes to the forested and natural areas on certain types of management practices. So um, that's where we uh, are have to be very uh, cautious because we want to make sure that these easements are, are both legally sound and um, can be monitored and maintained uh, for the, the length of time that we um, hold on to that easement. So uh, just adding that as, as a point of clarification as well to say that um, even the authority through the Conservation Land Act limits us uh, in that regard. Thanks, Martin. I'll leave it up just a few more minutes for any last remaining questions, and then we can close out the webinar. I've also uh, left a webinar feedback form for you all. Um, I invite you to fill it out to allow us to continue to improving, continue to improve our webinar offerings. Um, your responses are anonymous, and that is in the chat. Okay, it doesn't look like there are any more questions coming in. With that, I will move to our closing. So again, thank you everyone for participating, asking your questions and your comments. Um, and thank you, Joel and Megan, for sharing your expertise on this topic. If you'd like to more, learn more about farmland protection options, you can again, reach out to Joel. Their email is on the PowerPoint slide, or you can give our office a phone call, which is also on this slide. We have more resources available on our website. So um, I will add some links to the chat. And if you want some physical copies of those resources, Joel would be happy to mail more information out to you. Just let them know your address. Um, again, that, Feedback form is up and available for you to fill out. 
And this webinar is recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. So you will be getting an email from me with the link if you ever want to review it. And if you're looking to get more involved with OFT and what we do, you can make sure to stay up to date with us by following us on social media. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn, as well as joining our newsletter. Um, you can become a member or a donor. We have a volunteer program, which you can explore more with a link that I'll be adding in the chat. And lastly, our webinars and events don't end here. We have two more webinars coming up, one in December about um, species at risk on farmland, as well as one in January about farming with conservation in mind. And then we have our annual farmland forum happening in March of 2025, um, where we'll explore the theme of water in Alora, Ontario, as well as online. So stay tuned for the registration opening up in the new year. And again, I do thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you, Megan and Joel, for your participation, um, for Martin, for your participation as well. Um, and I hope you all have a great day.